Come on. Let's thank Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise tonight. Yes. Man, that, that worship tonight was so good. I just wanted to sing that revival song over and over. It's so powerful. Can we lift our hands? Is that okay? Just to continue to open our hearts to Him. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. My first church day since March. So my first time preaching to a live crowd, not a camera. What a treat. Father God, I thank you that you would remind me how to do this. And Lord, I pray that every single person in this place would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that we realize we are so weak compared to your strength. And it is crazy that so often we don't open ourselves up to you, Lord. So often we run off and try to do this life on our own. But tonight, I pray that we get a fresh reminder that you are with us, that you are for us, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, that nothing is impossible for you, Lord, that all things work together for good for those that love God are called according to your purpose. Lord, I thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. I thank you, Lord, therefore there is no longer any condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we are in Christ Jesus and no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. Lord, we thank you. Even when we are weak, you are strong. Your grace is sufficient for us. Your grace abounds to us tonight in Jesus' name. So, Lord, whatever people are facing here tonight, I thank you, Father. They leave this place filled with the Holy Spirit because we may not be able to go together back home, but your Spirit goes with us. You walk into our apartments. You walk into situations in our marriages, our families, our roommates, our colleges, and you are there with us, empowering us to face our Monday and not just to survive, but to thrive this week in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's give God some more praise. Amen. He deserves it. He is worthy. Anyway, I I just love praying. I think that's one thing I've learned this year that COVID has taught me that We should never neglect prayer. And uh, I want to tell some stories about New York because I'm just, uh, Josh, I'm just bewildered to be in a room full of people. So just bear with me while I adjust Um, in the best kind of way. I'm just like, don't want to weep because I haven't been with my church since March 15th. And uh, so I'm just kind of lingering. Is that okay? I'm like, wow, this is a moment. I can't wait to be with my church in New York and gather again, but this is reminding me how important this moment is. This is so important. We should fight for this every day of the week. Amen. Amen. We may be seated. Thank you guys for lingering and just dealing with my mess. My name is Josh. I get the privilege of uh, being married to my beautiful wife, Georgie. We've been married for 17 years in three weeks. Got married when I was 12. Hey, I know you were thinking it, so thank you. Appreciate it. (laughs) No, I got married when I was 22, just if you thought also Australians are weird and they get married young. Um, My wife is uh, an incredible, incredible leader. We get to lead the church together in New York City. We planted it seven years ago, and we're having a blast up there. It's just been an incredible ride. And then COVID hit. And this year hit, and it's been an even more interesting ride these last kind of 10 months. We have two little boys named Brooks and Zeph, eight and four. They're soccer crazy. They love soccer so much. All I do as a dad, the only reason I'm kind of slightly fit is that I just play soccer with them all all day, every day. They just uh, keep me fit, which I, I don't mind. It's a good thing. And so we send greetings from our church and our leaders, our staff. I've been texting them today saying, Guys, church is is really good. You can't, like, please, like, let's find a building we can meet in because we don't own our own building, so we're, like, kind of handcuffed to landlords. And so they're like, oh, we can't wait to worship together. And I'm like, it's amazing. I'm weeping. It's the best thing ever. And everyone's singing and lifting their hands, not just in bed watching a screen. It's pretty awesome. So anyway, they send their love as well. If you got your Bibles here tonight, Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. I want to share a few leadership points with you. As I've been thinking about this year and what's happened to the church, what's happened to us in New York City, I've been talking to our team and our members and our staff all about rebuilding, all about rebuilding, getting prepared to rebuild. 
And it's really important that we understand we can't just pretend that this year isn't a disaster. And not just talk about it, like you've heard it a million times, you hear it on news, you hear it from people on stage here, uh, on Zoom calls, like, oh, what a year, what a tough year, and everyone's saying that, but it's like, okay, can we now begin to move on from that narrative? Like, like we know it's a tough year, but what are we going to do about it, amen? And so I, I want us to catch a glimpse, catch a vision tonight from Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a, an amazing leader, amazing kind of manager in the Bible who catches a vision to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And it's a fascinating story because the, the walls in Jerusalem were laid in ruins for 500 years. So Ezra rebuilds the temple, which is what you always need to rebuild first. The center of your life is always the first thing you must rebuild. The center of a community, the center of a church, if Christ isn't at the center, that's the first thing you must place before you even deal with the walls. So I, I want to assume tonight, I'm coming to you tonight, that Christ is at the center. And if he, if he is a bit off center, can I invite you tonight to make him the center of your life? But I bet there's some areas in your life where there isn't boundaries and the enemy's getting access to the center of your life, into your thinking, into your heart, into areas that you are allowing the enemy to actually take and pillage that which is most valuable to God, which is your heart. Everything flows out of your heart. It, it, nothing nothing uh, that you're facing right now is a problem from the outside. It's all about the inside. Once I understood that, I could take authority and responsibility from my life. I, I can go through a situation where before COVID, five locations and things are growing to now, we, we just don't know where we're up to. And it's just a fascinating journey, but it's been so good for me because I realized that I was relying on some outside things, and the Lord has taken me back and showed me some unhealthy things in my heart, some unhealthy things in my marriage, some unhealthy things in my parenting. But I was running at such a pace that I didn't realize that there were some things that the devil had access to because I hadn't rebuilt the walls of my life. COVID is, is revealing, this year, 2020, is revealing there's some ruins in your life. There, there's some walls to rebuild. There's some things that God wants you to take responsibility for. That's interesting. 500 years, these walls lay in ruins. I want you to catch this. But it took 52 days to rebuild the walls. How many things in our life are we waiting for perfect situations and conditions to arrive to actually start the rebuild. How often we're like, well, you know, six will get back to a certain level, Wave Church will get back to a certain level, but when and how? Someone eventually has to say, you know what, we're gonna rebuild it. We're the generation. We're the people that's gonna rebuild it. Not just a church staff, not just LED screens and great preaching, but each individual taking ownership of a church family and saying, yes, Jesus is at the center of this, but I'm taking respons responsibility from my part of the wall. That's what legacy offering's about. I, I'm in shock. Like, I had the lowest expectations because this year has just, just wrecked us in so many ways, in a good way. Our church is strong and, and, and people are rising. It's amazing. But we've seen... Uh, 1,200 people from our church just move out of the city, like, boom, just, just gone. Friends, families, like people we've, we've been with for seven years, just, you get a text, hey, uh, I'm in Denver now, sorry, I'm not there anymore. You're like, what? We didn't even talk about, like, people just ran, and they're gone. And so there's been so much, so much heartache, and so we were heading into our kind of legacy moment. I just want to tell you this story to give you some faith about rebuilding, and taking ownership. And so last week, we said, are we going to do our vision builders moment, which is like your legacy? And we're a young church, we, you know, a lot of young people. And so uh, I didn't want to put pressure on anyone. And there was no compulsion. We're just saying, hey, we, we believe that now more than ever, the vision and the church is important. Now more than any, can anyone agree with that? Now more than ever, the vision is important. So if it's important, we must provide the provision for the vision. That's what giving's all about. You're saying, I'm provision. The provision in your hand, the money that you have in your hand is when you release it, it becomes provision 
for the vision, actually sources and fuels and moves things forward. And so we just said, hey, no expectation. We don't know if like $100 is gonna come in or 1,000, we just don't, we don't know. And so we did a big virtual gala, usually of like last year was 800 people sit down dinner and the team go all out, it's amazing, really beautiful. And so we couldn't do that, so we did a virtual gala. And halfway through my message, something just happened, like God started moving. We had, now this is gutsy, we had like the pledge amount behind me. And the team were like, you sure you wanna do that? <laughs> just sitting on zero dollars for the whole, the whole time. And I'm like, come on, let's just, I think, I think the church is excited. They wanna build, they, they've, they've got faith. And I, I turned, turned to the screen, I said to my, my team, I'm like, is that, is that right? Like, am I reading that right? Did you guys type in too many digits? And, and all of a sudden we see it, it was $2.5 million came in through this virtual gala. Now, yeah, we should praise God. That's, that's amazing. You know why it's amazing? Because through that, we're going to uh, help really uh, build a school for 500 kids in Uganda. We're, we're buying a church building for some persecuted pastors in the Middle East. Uh, we're, we're building a church in Paris and Berlin. So on the other side of legacy offering, on the other side of our Vision Builders moment, are lives that are going to be changed forever. And I just tell you that story because I had... No expectation. In fact, Georgie and I had a fight driving to the virtual gala because I was like sweating and I was so under pressure. And I just, I said to Georgie, I honestly, I just don't think I can do this anymore. Like this year has wrecked me. I don't want to be on camera and talk to invisible people anymore. And, and, and just, this is just too nuts. And she's, she's like, well, you gotta, you gotta figure it out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Literally, she basically said that. Now, she, she's a praying woman. She just started praying for me. But I did not want to show up. And that's what Nehemiah was like. He saw the need. One of the scriptures says that he, inspect, he inspected the damage. He surveyed the damage. I want you to survey the damage in your life from this year. Don't deny the things that have been stolen from you. Don't deny the hurt. But I believe that God took me to that place, even last week, and there's been many weeks, where I've just been in this place of hurting so much. God, I can't go on. But every time, he's taking me to this deeper place of reliance on him, where, where he's stripping back all my pride, everything that I thought that we were building, he's saying, no, this is all me. The, you're just an empty vessel, Josh. Now, you're, I love you and, and I value you, but it's not to you, it's through you. I wanna do something through your life. And God wants to do the same thing. So Nehemiah surveyed the damage, and we've gotta survey it in order to actually begin to meet the need. So it was 500 years, but it took 52 days. The enemy's trick, I believe, will be to paralyze us. The election coming up, everything else, everyone's just in this limbo. But the kingdom is not in limbo. God's not going like, let's wait and see what happens with COVID. Let's wait and see who gets in. He's like, what are you waiting for? And everyone around Nehemiah was going, oh, I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen. And Nehemiah's like, no, I'm going to see the damage. I'm going to see the reality. This is not good. Ezra's rebuilt the temple, and you guys are just letting enemies come in and pillage and take whatever they want. This is not okay. And that's what will happen to the people of God if the leaders in this room, if the, if the members in this church don't rise up and say, you know what, now is the time. We're going to rebuild it brick by brick. And we're gonna cover each other's backs. We're gonna stop the gossip train. We're gonna stop the negativity. We're gonna stop pulling down the house of God. And we're gonna start lifting up the name of Jesus. And we're gonna rebuild. It may take brick by brick, and it looks like a lot of work. And because it's been sitting in rubble for 500 years, you could think, well, that's gonna take forever, 52 days. Mark your calendar. Make it a campaign. 52 days from now, we're gonna see things get stronger and healthier. Our prayer life, our word life, our, our connect groups, every area of young adult ministry and wave church, I believe that it can get stronger, but it's gonna happen when each part of the body takes responsibility. And the first thing that you need to understand in chapter one, verse five, it says, then I, Nehemiah said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great an awesome God, watch, watch his posture. 
Just beautiful. It's all about elevating God. Then he reminds God of his own word. Who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. I started praying like Nehemiah this year. I, I, I've, I've rediscovered a place of authority in my prayer life, that God is not afraid of, of strong prayers that are actually based in his word. Because the enemy, if you're anything like me, the enemy is having a field day in your mind. And I'm so proud of you for being here tonight. For some of you, you just dragged yourself out on a cloudy kind of Sunday evening, but you got here. But it was a battle for some of you. For, for others, it, you just kind of on autopilot, it's like, okay, cool, this is the thing I do once a month. That's great. But, but what if we just lent in right now? And he said, you know what? I, I, I want to remind God over my life and over my family and over my church of his unfailing love that he can do something mighty. And he, he promised to keep his covenant. And he promised that he's going to bring breakthrough. And he promised he's going to bring healing. And he promised that he died and rose again to give me new life. So I'm not going to live in that old creation life. I'm a new creation. I'm a son of God. I'm not a slave to fear and sin. I am a son. I, I, am, I have royalty, so therefore I can speak to the king with authority. And Nehemiah, he prayed with, with strength. The first thing we need to know is that we need to understand and know his word. How does that look? It's based on his promises. What has he promised you? What has he promised your marriage, your family, your friendships? Do you have them written down? Do you know them off by heart when the enemy comes to lie? And it's like, because a lie, lie is always counteracted by a promise. But lies in your mind will live there as long as you don't speak the promise. The promise breaks the lie. But you cannot break the lie if you don't know his word. See, the word does the work in your mind instead of you getting more anxious and more stressed out. But if I don't let the word do the work in my mind, then fear will grow. And Nehemiah refused to let this wall be in rubble any longer. Here's my observation. Nehemiah knew the Torah. He knew the law of God. He knew the way of God. And he quoted a part of it back to God. He knew that God had said it, said if the people were obedient, God would bring his people back to the place he had chosen for his name to be honored. So it's a fascinating thing. You as an individual, as a leader, and together as a community can remind God of his promise to this church. You can remind God of his promise to you as a family. But here's the thing. Sometimes we just make up our own promises. We create our own idea of what God should do for us. But did he actually ever promise you that? That's dangerous. Because we have an expectation that he never said he would fulfill. He never said you would have a perfect life. He never said every time you do this, that will equal that. He didn't say that you will always be prosperous in every business deal. He didn't say that. But he did say he'll give you strength to walk through every valley. He did say that he will give you wisdom if you ask for it in faith, not in doubt. So there are promises that you can stand upon to combat the lie of the enemy rather than living in this fear and then creating these kind of pie-in-the-sky expectations of God that are not based in the Word. And because he knew the Word, he could ask God something based on his Word, and he knew that within the Word, it has its own power to fulfill it. It's living and active. So when I speak it and I believe it, I activate something that's living. And so when I start to speak over my wife and my kids and my church, things begin to happen. Now, it comes in seed form, so you don't always see the results. But what God would say is, do not dig up the seed. Let it die. Let it go through its process of uh, burial and resurrection in order to bring about fruit in your life. The word has power. So the principle is this, a leader must know God's word. This is the principle. The observation is that he, that's what he did, but the principle is, do you know his word? If you know his word, you'll be able to lead in this life. Number two, Nehemiah had a heart for the city that led him to pray. 
Now, let me just share some prophetic thoughts that I've got in my own prayer time with the Lord because I've been dreaming and thinking because we can't open yet. We still don't know. It'll probably be in 2021. Most, the earliest I can foresee based on negotiations with buildings at the moment, even going through winter and different uh, things happening with COVID in Europe and what will probably hit our city, the earliest I can see it happening is March. That means we've been out of church for a full year. And even then, we still don't know. So I'm asking the Lord. I'm praying. And that's what I've been doing mostly in my office is just praying because I, I can't do all the other church activities. So it's been good. So I'm actually doing what I was always called to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, and, and so often we get caught up in the administration of church rather than just seeking the God of the church. So the Lord spoke to me and uh, he took me to the book of Acts because that's how we start our church. We started with a dinner party, Acts, 42, Acts 2, 42 to 47. They met around tables, devoted themselves to apostles' teaching, broke bread, signs and wonders. Um, and so we, we run dinner parties and our vision is to have a dinner party on every block in New York City. We have about 100 dinner parties, but we started with one and that's how we're believing we'll reach the neighborhoods in every area of New York City. And so he said, how did I open my church? So I'm praying, God, how do we reopen? How do we regather? He said, Josh, how did I open my church? Upper room. He birthed his church in prayer. And I believe prophetically, because God did something for many of you in your private devotion, but what God wants, yes, he wants church services and worship and preaching of the word, but I think we can miss a window and you guys sung about revival tonight. And if I can just be so bold, I, I really feel like this is our hour, church, to go back to what actually birthed the church. If we're talking about really reopening the church, he wants to reopen it with prayer. Because anything you open with prayer is then sustained by the Spirit. And anything you open with the flesh has to be maintained by your energy. And no wonder we have burned out Christians. No wonder we're so worn out because we never birthed it in the spirit. Come on, anyone here today? You, did you birth that decision in the spirit? Did you birth that marriage in the spirit? Did you, did you actually pray about it? Because if you pray about it and welcome the Holy Spirit into it, you now have the Holy Spirit. What did he say? Wait until power comes. Wait until. So we're gonna rush back into everything we're doing and not have the power to do it. And so I, I believe that Nehemiah shows us he didn't start rebuilding yet. It, the pattern is there throughout Scripture. He didn't go, well, this makes sense, bricks, let's do this. No, the first thing he, he knew. How do I actually inspire a generation that has not built this wall for 500 years? Prayer. I'm calling you to prayer, to pray for Virginia Beach, to pray for Norfolk, to pray for every area in Virginia. Like, do we want this state for Jesus? Do, do we want to see revival? Are we, or are we going to be so, uh, Western Christian generation that's self-focused and wants what we want out of church? Or are we going to be known as a generation that said enough is enough? We're reopening the church with revival prayer. And everything we do is going to be birthed by the Spirit. Everything we do is gonna be burst in prayer. So you had a heart for the city that led him to prayer. So my observation is this, out of verses five to 11. Nehemiah's heart for the city led him to pray to God in praise. So this was his pattern of prayer. Praise, confession of sin, and prayer for kindness from the king. So that was his sequence. He needed, uh, he needed the influence of the king to actually release him to do it. So there'll be favor with man and favor with God. But the process was first praising God, then confession of sin, both for himself and his people. You unlock favor when you admit your wrongs. But if we, if we live and start adding to the noise of judgmentalism, 
that is sweeping this nation, the gospel will be drowned out. I'm, I'm calling you to get off social media, or if you are on it, be a voice of hope. Point people to King Jesus. Point people to him, amen? Point people to him. First, praise. Then, be transparent and vulnerable. Admit your own wrongs rather than pointing out the log in someone else's eye. Your, the log in your own eye, yeah, speck, whatever. <laughs> I preached a message once with a log in my eye the whole time, and then I got off the stage and I had this like big <laughs> ring on my eye. But, but it was a powerful point, um, yeah. <laughs> point number three. Oh, let me give you the principle to that point. A leader is action-oriented. He or she attempts new things, takes initiative, and works towards something. Nehemiah not only, not only had a heart for the city, but he acted on it. I, I know you're here because you, you love people, you love God, but make a step, take a step into action. And that could be as simple as recovering your morning prayer and just saying, you know what, Monday morning, just, just give him five minutes, just five minutes, which is, you got to realize how simple we are that that's difficult. The creator of all things, like the maker of heaven and earth, and I give more time to Netflix. <laughs> like, wh how, what are we doing? Like, for real. And we wonder why our country is where it's at. But God doesn't need thousands. He just needs a few. He wasn't worried how many people were in the upper room. He just wanted whoever's there, let's be all about it. And that's what I'm asking for you tonight. Whoever's here, let's be all about it. And I'm also understanding that it's gonna take some time to rebuild this, this muscle called prayer. It's gonna take 21 days of focused work and saying, okay, I'm gonna start with five minutes. Now, if you, if you pray an hour a day, that's great. But I've, I've got to admit, before COVID, I had lost some of that muscle because I was so busy with doing the thing that he called me to do that I forgot about the power that I needed to do it with. And I've just been spending hours in my office. Here's a, here's a tip. I, I listen to this guy named William Augusto. Does anyone know him? Just uh, instrumental worship. And he just has like these three-hour songs so you can write it down, William Augusto. And I just pray with that on. I put it on there. I sing in the spirit, pray in tongues. I read scripture. I just, I just pray and pray and pray. And God's showing me all these things. And, and I'm seeing miracles in our church, even when we're not even meeting. And you know why? Because God answers prayer, yo. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> So I'm trying to get like, we got to get back to church. we got to make all this happen. And God's like, I can do it. Yeah. You can do it. <laughs> like for real. Why are we stressed out? We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. I'm getting my preaching voice on now. See, I got, I got different, you know, versions. I can go there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Number three, burden for the people. Verse four, watch this. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. I've never cried more in my entire life than this year. I just cry. Well, I mean, I'm already a crier, so that doesn't help. I'm, gonna, I'm talking about crying, and I'm about to cry. <laughs> But it's been genuine in the sense that my heart is just breaking from my city. Just so much violence and just businesses lost and families pulled apart and suicide and kids shot. Like just, and it's just so easy to get numb, isn't it? I, I just, and it's good. You should turn the news off and, and I, I, I do that. But don't lose your heart for people. That's, that's, what, that's what the enemy wants this year. You're just so numb to all the issues that you create a false protection and you lose your heart for people. 
And so many relationships have been split up and disagreements over different views. And, but, but Jesus calls us higher, that he would still let his betrayer sit at the table with him. He would still allow Judas to be there and still speak to him with love. Never lose your burden for people. So the observation here is Nehemiah had a heart and concern for the city. This is shown in the way he wept. See, mourning and weeping must come before joy. But if we rush the mourning process, then we'll never take people into the joy of the Lord. If people are hurting, just sit with them. Just be with them. If they're not at church yet, just be with them. Go to them. Bring them a coffee if they're disconnected. Bring forgiveness. Be the bigger person. This is what Nehemiah is saying. He's saying, be the bigger person. Amen? Have a burden for the people. The principle here is a leader has to have a caring heart for God and obedience to him. The broken walls and the gates destroyed by fire reminded Nehemiah about Israel's past disobedience, which led to his mournful response. He, he was so moved by the destruction, but also what moved him to weep was the people's disobedience. When's the last time you wept about someone's sin? Not in a judgmental way, but you just know that God has better for them. That you care enough that you're going to be the one that's going to pray them back into the kingdom or pray them back into relationship. Number four, he was prepared for the opportunity. Prepared for the opportunity. There's an opportunity before us, but you've got to get ready. I believe that the, each church and each believer will be given opportunities to see the rebuilding of this nation, of, this, of our churches, of our cities, in a, in a way that represents the kingdom. When I'm talking about rebuilding, I'm saying rebuilding the way God wants it to be. And we gotta understand that there is gonna be opportunities for you, whether you're a high school student here and you get to witness to your, your friends and, or you're in college, what, whatever generation you're in tonight, whatever vocation you represent, I believe there's opportunities, but God wants you to be prepared. And I found I've missed many opportunities because I was not prepared. And sometimes in difficult times, all we can see is the disaster that we miss the opportunity. Can you see it? This is the finest hour of the church. Can you see it? This is the time when the church will be most valuable. You got to see it. You'll see it in the upper room. You got to discover it in the spirit. You will see it in prayer. But if you just see it from empty seats and, and COVID masks and air high fives, and you're, oh, I long for the old days. Yes, me too. And they, it, it, this too shall pass. But the reality is, while we're all wanting the good old days, we're missing our opportunity. There is a move of God that I believe can sweep church by church, city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street, but the, but the enemy wants you to be blinded and hurt and stuck in lies and, oh, this, this is hopeless, negativity speaking death over your life, speaking death over your own mind, over your own self-esteem, your own identity. No, Nehemiah took it upon himself. He said, no, I'm, I'm going to make a difference. It's 500 years is too long. 52 days, we're going to do this. You can make a difference in Jesus' name. So, where's the verse? He said, if it please the king, in chapter two, verse four, if it please the king and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I'll be gone to the king, he agreed to my request. I also said to the king, if it please the king, let me have the letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter to address to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber, 
I'll need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and, a, and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. He was prepared for an opportunity. Everyone say, he was prepared. We just read these stories, but we kind of look over some of the details. If you're in front of a king that has the power to kill you, if the request is off, that means you can't just walk into that court unprepared. He was prayed up and prepared, and he knew how to, how to ask in order, to, firstly, to be released, but then he'd obviously been prepared because he'd already asked for the forest. He'd already kind of done some sort of measurements or design and realized this is where, where I want to go. Before even other people really started getting on board, he was prepared. Now, I want you to catch this. So often we don't get prepared until we see other people moving. We, we kind of like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing versus actually taking responsibility for our own time and our resources, getting our mind prepared, getting our ask prepared when we're in, in front of a boss or in front of a person and getting ready to actually have that opportunity be maximized in Jesus' name. Why? Why was he prepared, church? Why was he prepared? Because he knew the hand of grace was upon him. When you know that grace is on you, you'll get prepared. Because wherever you are, opportunities will come. If you realize that you are a graced son or daughter of the Most High God, that revelation changes how you operate in Jesus' name. Number five, uh, I, I'm got a rhythm here, so I may as well keep giving the observation in principle. When the opportunity came to tell the king about why he was sad and what he hoped to do, Nehemiah was ready. The principle is a leader must be prepared and ready when his opportunity comes. When an opportunity arises, a leader is not only able to take advantage of it, he has adequately, 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 oh my gosh, adequately, <laughs> Can someone say that word for me? Adequately. Yes. There. Oh, my gosh. I told you it's my first time preaching to a live crowd. Don't judge me. Okay. Number five, Nehemiah surveyed the damage. Surveyed the damage. Here's the point. Need and vision go together. Need and vision go together. See, sometimes when you see need, it's hard to see a vision because the need is so overwhelming. But if you're a praying person, if you're a person that steps into the Holy Spirit, if you understand God's promises and you understand his word, for me right now in New York City, the need was just hitting me day after day. And I felt like we were just keeping our head above the water and then uh, June hit and then racial injustice and just... Our church is super diverse, and everyone had an opinion on everything. We're trying to please everyone, and people are leaving for all sorts of reasons, and you couldn't make anyone happy. I said this, and they're not happy. I said this, you're not happy, and I'm like, help a brother out. <laughs> but we wept together, and we did what we could, and we're continuing to do what we, could, we can do, but, but the, the issue is that the need was so big that I started to lose my vision. And I started to say things like, what's the point? George and I began to discuss how we're going to move back to Australia. I wanted to give up. I'm telling you right now, July and August, two of the darkest months of my life. Building for seven years. And I'm saying, God, what, what is going on? Not only have I laid my life down for this city and helped all these people, and, and I'm, I'm making it about me, and I'm, I'm, my, my language is very self-focused, my thinking is very self-focused, but the need was overwhelming that I, that I started to lose why God called me in the first place. Anyone relate to me tonight? <laughs> Any other real people here want to give up? Anyone say that this year? What's the point? Just a honest pastor here tonight, just letting you know that I've been through some dark days, but I realized, oh, I get it. Need and vision go together. <laughs> I 
the need that you're facing is connected to the vision he gave you. The, the, the deficiency in your life could be the greatest catalyst for vision in your life. What, what does Nehemiah have a vision for if the walls are already built? See, it's interesting that we live in a dreamer generation, but we don't want to admit the need. We don't want to face the need. We want someone else to deal with the need. We just want the end result of the vision. We want to be part of a church where the wall's already built. And then when it's built, we complain about it. It's too loud. It's too bright. It's this. It's, I like that song. and I like Bethel. I like Hillsong. It's like, what? No, no, no. Get a vision. And as soon as it's built, find a new need. Because if you don't find the need, your vision will dry up. And that's when complaint starts to arise again. That's when judge, judgmentalism rises in churches, is the, 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 the wall is built. So now what do we do? We need a fresh vision. And so understand that need and vision go together. The observation here is that Nehemiah showed the need for the work he planned to do by reminding the people that they were vulnerable without a city wall and were in a position of disgrace. That's good leadership. Because leaders that don't tell you the truth and just tell you the vision, you won't actually have the motivation for the vision. So we can say, come on, let's save New York City. Come on, guys, clap. Yeah, come on, let's shout. Let's... And they're like, I don't know why we need that. Do you know what I'm saying? So you have to describe the depravity. You have to talk about it. We started talking about it, and then the vision made sense because you saw the need. Is anyone following what I'm saying? Just last week, this is the best. We started talking about marriage restoration, and this couple joined our church during online and watched our services each Sunday and separately because they were divorced. They've been divorced for five years. Five years is a long time to be divorced. And... I get this message last week that they just got remarried and reconciled and forgave each other for five years. And they're now remarried, living together, working with a Christian counselor, giving to Vision Builders last week, wanting to build a family on the Word of God with Christ at the center. Let me tell you, you got to talk about the need so people can get a vision. <laughs> Come on, let's give God some praise. Amen. That deserves some praise. Amen. I say all that because that was the need that I was talking about. We need reconciliation. We were talking about reconciliation, not just in marriages, but in our nation, our city, and people that were friends and no longer friends after this year. Do you know what the word Satan means in the original language? It means splitter. So let me, let, me, let me say another prophetic thing that I've realized, that everything we're facing as a nation, there's a deeper issue, right? You see that? The deeper issue is that he's the splitter. So he doesn't care what he uses. He, now, racism is, is real in the sense that that's, that's a core issue and part of the history of this nation that we need to continue to unwind, and it's very real for my black brothers and sisters that I work with and on our staff and I ask them stories. I'm like, wow, this is real. This, you actually face these things. But the bigger issue underneath, enemy doesn't care. He wants to divide. The deeper issue is that he's a splitter. He's a splitter when it comes to the nation right now over politics. He doesn't care. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy friendships, marriages, relationships, families, the deeper issue. And the same was here for Nehemiah. The enemy came from all different angles. What To do what? To split and to divide because he didn't want them to keep the vision and rebuild the wall. He, he wanted them to put down their shovels and their, their hammers and say, oh, this is too hard. He wanted the families fighting each other on the wall. This is my wall. This is your part. And he, 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 just, he does not care. The deeper issue that you're facing in your marriage is not the issue. It's division. He's a splitter. 
How good are those fights, Luke, where you're like, I forgot what we're fighting about with your wife? Like, what? Because he doesn't care. He just wants you fighting. He just wants you divided. So you gotta keep reminding yourself in your relationships, that's the deeper issue. Last point, I'll finish on this. Nehemiah 2, 17 to 18, let's read this. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And watch this. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. Yes, let's rebuild the wall. Point number six is let us. We need every single person to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah was not kidding himself. He knew this was not a solo mission. It, it would have been 500 years if he did it by himself. But that's what happens is people go, oh man, it's 500 years, it's been destroyed. Look how bad it is. Look at the wreckage. He, he, he said, no, listen, if we focus, if we, have, if we don't have to use all of our energy trying to motivate a church to do things that we are meant to be motivated by by the Holy Spirit, we can use all of that energy, all of that creativity, all of that strength to reach people that are not in this room right now. I, I say that to our church all the time. You realize that when we have to follow Christians up, that's someone else that we don't have time to follow up someone that's truly lost. Now we can follow everyone up and we're here to help. We need to stand together. But we gotta, at some point, we gotta be like these people and say, no, I'm not just gonna stand and watch. I'm gonna rebuild. I'm gonna be at team night. I'm gonna join in. I'm gonna be a giver. I'm gonna be a prayer. I'm gonna be part of the answer. Let us build in Jesus' name. Come on, someone say amen. Someone say let us. Get a heavenly vision and understand that the vision is connected to the need. Begin to pray. How do we reopen the church? We open it the way God started in the first place. It's not just playing games. Oh, we just need church for church's sake. It is good. But what if we took church to a whole nother level? What if we just actually turn this place into a revival center once a month and every Sunday morning we're like, we're prayed up. And whether there's 100 people or 5,000, it doesn't matter because God just needs sold out hearts that are not playing religious games anymore. They're saying, you know what? Let's rebuild. Let's build this wall because it's only going to take 52 days and this church could be stronger than ever. And I'm, I'm preaching, you, preaching to you. You're already further on than we are. But I'm saying I, I feel inspired by being in this room tonight. I feel inspired by being in this room this morning to, to take this passion back to our church and say, hey, not only are we going to sing songs, but we're going to rebuild our city. We're going to rebuild lives and marriages and families and children and the next generation. We're going to see souls saved in Jesus' name. And it's not just hot air and, and passionate preaching. This is the Word of God. He says that He will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is, I believe, the finest hour. Do you know that the only time that the church has matched the growth chart of the early church is in the Chinese church? The only time that curve of the New Testament acts, that, that curve has been matched is because of the underground Chinese church matched the same things that were taking place in the early church. Ones of persecution, ones where they had to get scattered all the time, which was forcing them out of a place of comfort. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the most outer parts of the world. How did God fulfill that? It wasn't by their own doing. He did it through persecution. So we, we come into our safe places, and this is a place that you get filled up, but that's our job's not done tonight. It's just about to start this week. We're gonna go out there being salt and light, amen? We're gonna, this isn't the rebuilding part. The rebuilding happens after this moment. It re, we are rebuilding when we walk out. This is the call. 
let us rebuild. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet right now across this place. I feel fired up. I could preach for like a really long time because I haven't preached like since March and just like take up everyone's time. They're like, wow, that guy was good, but he just went a little long, you know. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to force anything. I just, I just want someone to catch. Holy Spirit, thank you, Jesus. If you, just, if you want him, just reach out. He's here. If you want him, he's just looking for hungry hearts. He's here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. It's not in the eloquence. It's in his power. It's not in the flashiness. It's in his power, church. Come on, just get filled up. I know there's people here and your tank is empty. Your heart's not filled with the Spirit of God, but there's no judgment. Don't feel bad that you're not filled with the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. Just receive it. And remember, you receive it because the blood of Christ has covered you. So receive it. If you need to repent of not seeking Him each day, and just come back to Him. Turn in your heart. Right now, just lift your hands if you want to turn back to Him and say, I need you, Lord. I'm not talking about new salvation. I'm talking about hearts that just need the Holy Spirit. I'll let Josh do a call for people if you want to receive Jesus for the first time. But I just feel my mission here is to turn every single believer on fire right now with the Holy Spirit right now. Thank you, Father. Come on. Why don't you lift your hands as a sign of surrender? Come on. He, either he's worthy or he's not. Either he's worthy or he's not. Either he's worthy or he's not. Either we want him or we don't. Either he's our first love or he's nothing. There's no in-between. If we were to catch a glimpse of his glory, there, there wouldn't be a, a dry eye in this place. There wouldn't be a heart that would be closed off. Amen. Hallelujah. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you worship. Thank you, Jesus. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Holy Spirit, there is no other. There is no other God beside you. Thank you, Lord. All the seraphim around the throne singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the whole earth is filled with His glory. Come on, His glory. His glory is in this place right now. His power is in this place right now. Receive it. Get a fresh touch from God for prayer. To seek Him. To have intimacy with Him. Thank you, Lord, that this would be a church that reopens with prayer, that reopens with revival, that reopens with passion, that reopens with knowing the Word of God, that we would say, let us rebuild. We have a vision. We're not going to wait. We're not going to wait. We're going to rebuild by the power of His Spirit in Jesus' Name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just, I just sense... Uh, you know, so it's not just like a metaphor. I, I actually believe that the, the bricks tonight represent people's lives. And if you have disconnected from people and there's unforgiveness in your life towards others, maybe even in this room, or I just really sense that the Lord wants to put us back together. The Lord wants to put us back together. Why? Because Peter said it, we're living stones. What was the first stone that was laid? It's the cornerstone. The cornerstone. What does the cornerstone represent? Re represents self-sacrifice, sacrificial, agape, love. Now every stone that's laid on it must also represent the first stone that was laid. So if, if you just want to reconnect and just bring forgiveness, maybe it's in marriages or friendships or leadership here, right now, just lift your hand and say, yeah, I, Let's get put back together right now. Just, I want forgiveness to flow. Maybe there's bitterness or offense or you felt overlooked. And then I'll, I'll hand back to Josh. I just really sensed that as we were praying just then. Lord, I just thank you right now. A prayer of reconciliation. Right now, a prayer of reconciliation in this place. Wherever there's been offense, 
Lord, right now, we thank you. Forgiveness flows. The blood of Jesus floods that part, that wounded person right now, that the disconnection in the marriage, the, the disconnection in the friendship, even tonight. There will be texts sent and calls made, Lord. I just thank you, Father, for reconnection in Jesus' name. Because, God, that's what you want. You came to earth to connect us again. You came to earth not for us just to say nice Christian things. You came to earth so that we'd be reconciled first to you and reconciled to each other. The vertical in the cross and the horizontal in the cross. That's what it's all about. We're in this together in Jesus' name. Come on. What a, what a privilege to speak to you tonight. Can we give God some praise right now? Come on, let's give God some, some glory. You guys are awesome.